Scarface is a film that needs no introduction for anyone even remotely familiar with 80s movies or even crime movies. It's an iconic film with a story so shocking that it still holds up over 40 years later. The film has an abundance of iconic moments, shocks, one-liners, and twists as well as presentation that is simultaneously as psychotically over the top as it is melancholic and tragic. Part of the reason I think the film holds up so well beyond its classic iconography is the characters. Characters, at least in my eyes, are the proverbial spine to any fictional world, and yes, that was a reference to Transistor for all 12 of you watching this who know about that. In my eyes, even the most incredibly well-written plot would mean practically nothing if there wasn't at least one character to properly connect to and care for. Good characters can even carry an otherwise mediocre story into the status of pop culture legend. Heck, just look at Scooby-Doo. That show was some of the most formulaic children's television of all time, but the characters were so lovable that it's become a pop culture phenomenon. Scarface is a prime example of how to write characters, specifically how to turn severely flawed people into likable and sympathetic characters. Tony Montana is a coked up narcissist. Manny is little more than a common Miami thug who just happened to be connected to the right and wrong people. Gina is a naive brat, but these characters become so much more when you start to peel back the layers. They're like Shrek. Did I just unironically compare the characters of Scarface to Shrek? You'll bet your sweet bippy I did! Tony Montana may be a coked up narcissist, but he's got such an endearing and yet simultaneously bizarre swagger that you can't help but smile whenever he's in a good mood. The film is also littered with moments where he shows very genuinely likable attributes. You can tell he cares very deeply for his loved ones, even if the ways he goes about showing it are often well past the line of acceptable. Manny may just be one of tens of thousands of thugs in a business way too dangerous for them to survive, and it's hard to deny that his moral compass is severely compromised given the people he openly associates with. But the dude is just such a real one that you can't help but utterly adore him. Unlike Tony, who's prone to utterly psychotic outbursts while suffering from a condition commonly known on the streets of Miami as being an asshole, Manny is such a sincere and compassionate guy, and you can tell he doesn't take well to the uglier sides of the world that he's found himself in. You really do get the impression that if it weren't for his loyalty to Tony, he'd have left the drug world the moment the opportunity presented itself. And Gina? God help her. She's a naive brat with no idea what kind of water she's treading by getting involved in her brother's life. But she's also an ignorant 19-year-old who comes from a world in time that did her no favors in providing an education. She doesn't wish harm on anybody. She's not an ill-meaning person at all. She's just a young woman trying to start a life for herself. Her mom obviously did her best, but it was never going to be enough given how much Gina trusted Tony. Scarface has no shortage of compelling characters, but one that I feel goes far too often unsung is Michelle Pfeiffer's Elvira Hancock. The unfortunate reality is that she's probably the easiest character to just write off as a coked up loser, and in truth it's not hard to see why. Part of what makes Elvira fly so under the radar in a movie as colorful and energetic as this is just how low-key she's played off. She appears, she has her character moments, but there's really only one scene where she's given a standout moment, and even then its resolution lacks a certain sense of finality, and the focus of the scene is soon redirected right back to Tony so he can deliver another iconic monologue. Elvira rarely gets any direct narrative attention, and it ends up being something of a compliment to her arc in a sort of meta way. Regardless, I think it actually ended up having something of a Streisand effect, at least for me. They call so little attention to Elvira throughout the duration of the film that I can't help but glue my eyes to her whenever she's on screen, and no, it's not just because she's pretty. If anything, she's far from the most overtly appealing female character, even though it's obvious that Tony sees her as the most appealing woman on Earth. And to be clear, that's not a dig at Michelle Pfeiffer or anything like that, either. You're not about to catch me not falling for a stare like that. Woo! Anyways, yeah. Elvira is very pretty, but she's not particularly voluptuous or sensually presented. Uh, let me put it this way. She's no Elvira. Elvira's almost stone-cold demeanor in an ensemble as colorful and compelling as this is part of the reason why I think I find her so interesting. Like I said, she's easy to write off as less interesting than everyone else, but she's also, like them, like Shrek. She's got layers. 
Contrary to what her cocaine-induced figure may suggest, those layers are actually pretty thick. Like any good onion. Okay, I'll stop with the Shrek analogies. One thing I've noticed when re-watching Scarface is just how little agency Elvira possesses. This wasn't just some occasional happening either, it's consistent in every scene that she's in. And I don't mean to suggest that she's being written as just an item for Tony. On the contrary, I think the presentation of her as a sort of trophy girl is very intentional because it's an essential aspect of her characterization that she be seen by the majority as an accessory to the powerful and larger-than-life men that she associates with. When Elvira first appears, she's immediately presented as little more than a trophy girl for Frank to show off and an almost by-the-books love interest for Tony to fawn over. The cinematography and direction are very deliberate about this, it's not even remotely subtle, and yet paradoxically, while everyone else is chewing the scenery with the exaggerated swagger of a Miami coke dealer, Elvira is making snide observations and asking passive-aggressive questions with her only front being a half-assed smile that veils her contempt with all the effectiveness of a paper mache against a Category 5 hurricane. After saying hello, she immediately points out that this date Frank was supposed to take her on is now featuring a party of five. When she asks Frank where they're going for dinner, he suggests the Babylon Club, to which Elvira immediately rolls her eyes, asking, Again? She even cracks a joke about how easy it would be to assassinate Frank. Frank immediately turns this into a joke asking who would even want to kill him, which is not only ironic given the company, but it also takes all of the attention off of Elvira and immediately puts it back onto Frank. It's not that she needs the attention, but I imagine the frequency in which she's so overshadowed and relegated into an at-best supporting role by her larger-than-life associates eventually has to start demotivating and discouraging her. That kind of thing can seriously weigh on your psyche over time. Even her last line of the scene feels somewhat defeated, with her basically handing off the conversation to Frank by segueing into another talking point for him. Cut to the Babylon Club, and Elvira could not look less dejected if she tried. While Frank, Tony, and Omar are basically having their own little soiree, Elvira's stuck at Frank's backside, practically invisible and hanging off the corner of the sea. This date she was probably looking forward to has somehow been twisted to have her as the one person being left out even though she was just being ogled and admired back at Frank's mansion. Yet somehow, with literally hundreds of more people, and despite being the big shot supposed trophy wife, she's completely invisible. After Frank starts giving Tony a lesson in business with lesson number one, Elvira snidely repeats lesson number two, which is not to get high on your own supply. Without missing a beat, Frank turns this around into a dig at Elvira, revealing that she's a cocaine addict and further alienating her from the group, even though they're all just as gluttonous and hooked as she is. Of course, it's so much more unbecoming of a beautiful woman, though, right? Again, this was originally supposed to be a fun evening just between her and Frank, at least to her understanding. Having said that a few times now, I should probably make it clear that I don't think Elvira was exactly swooning over Frank. She does express some degree of affection for him at one point, but whatever she feels for him is likely only there because he's one of the few relatively good things going on in her life. Though it's hard to be definitive about this given how little we know about Elvira prior to the events of the film. Regardless, I think it's fair to assume that before meeting Frank, she was probably either broke or living a pretty hollow life as an heiress. It's not hard to believe that either could be the case, and it's clear coming from either background why she might have initially been attracted to Frank. Charming rich man that promises you the world in exchange for your love? That's not the kind of thing most people would just pass on, and it's not difficult to imagine a guy as charming as Frank having a genuine appeal at some point. Sure, he's a bit of a greaseball and a pig, but he's also a charismatic guy who wears his heart on his sleeve. He may have enemies in the drug trade, but outside of that, it's hard to imagine him being anything but a lovable socialite. He's the cool uncle that you'd always look forward to seeing at get-togethers. All of this is to say that it's clear there was once some degree of genuine affection between the two. However, at this point, it's pretty apparent that Frank gives Elvira very little in the ways of reciprocation at least when they're out in public, which they most certainly are a lot of the time. Frustrated and bored, Elvira decides to go dance. She asks Frank, but for the second time in a row, she's met with a pretty cruel remark, with Frank saying that he'd rather have a heart attack than dance with her. 
She then asks Tony if he'd like to join her, likely because he and Omar are the only two Frank wouldn't have a fit seeing her dance with, and, well, let's be honest here, between Tony and Omar, who was Elvira gonna pick first? Poor Omar probably wouldn't have even been asked if Tony had said no. Out on the dance floor, it's pretty apparent that Elvira isn't having the best time. Her attention is completely diverted from Tony, and her dancing is... Well, she's not doing the stereotype of white women not being able to dance any favors, let's just say that. Tony tries chatting her up, but she completely stonewalls him. And in fairness to Tony, he's being pretty sincere with his approach here. He's not tossing out corny one-liners or going out of his way to look cool. He's just trying to get to know her. He's dialing up the charm, but he's not getting carried away with it or saying anything out of line. Elvira does reveal that she's from Baltimore, but quickly insists that it doesn't matter where she's from in an attempt to shut down the interaction. This is also somewhat telling of the way that she views the facets of her life that are particular to herself, likely the result of spending so much time as an accessory to people considered far more important than her. Tony explains that he's just trying to be friendly, but Elvira claims that she doesn't need any more friends. Even throwing in a pretty hard pint of some straight-up racism. Is Elvira actually racist? I mean, I kinda doubt it considering that she's dating a Hispanic man and will go on to marry another Hispanic man. But this is the early 80s, so hey, you can interpret it however you want. Personally, I find it hard to gauge if she even sincerely looks down on Tony. If anything, it just comes off as her being as outwardly rude as possible possible in an attempt to distance herself from Tony. This behavior might seem strange given that she's the one who asked Tony to dance with her in the first place, but I imagine that she must be feeling some degree of push and pull from her life with Frank. On one hand, her life with Frank has left her with very little of a social life. This is pretty obvious even at this point, but it becomes even more clear as time goes on. However, it's because of this very issue that Frank is likely the only source of warmth and comfort that Elvira has in her life. That's a pretty crappy situation to be left in, so it makes sense why Elvira would feel so conflicted in dealing with Tony or really any of Frank's associates. Naturally, Tony isn't a fan of being associated with the influx of Cuban crime, and he gets pretty defensive. We're still fairly early on in the movie, so Tony doesn't completely fly off the handle, but he does ask Elvira what her problem is, claiming that she's got it easy being such a beautiful woman in a place surrounded by guys who'd do just about anything for her. Even this early on, it's pretty obvious that Tony is only in love with the idea of Elvira, rather than sincerely having an interest in her as a person. And while he may occasionally win her over with his charm and swagger, the two of them are never going to have a genuine connection. It's worth noting that Elvira does take to Tony's charm. He's got a very silly and even youthful side to him that's likely very absent in the friends that she makes through Frank, who I would imagine are always trying to be cordial and professional. When it comes to the world of crime, even arm's length is often too close for comfort when it comes to dealing with the boss's family, especially when dealing with his woman. Tony's completely genuine in his approach, and I imagine it's very refreshing to see for Elvira, so it's not hard to see why she would see him as a newfound source of positivity, given her probably very lonely and reclusive lifestyle. The car shop scene is also a really good example of this. Assault, I'm gonna say, uh, not very cool, but who doesn't snicker a bit when Tony puts on the bonnet? Now there is a sentence I never thought I would say. Elvira's next scene is a little bit later when things have gone downhill between Tony and Frank. This is the calm before the storm for Tony, but for Elvira, it seems like an opportunity to escape what I would imagine has been a pretty miserable life. Tony opens up the conversation asking how Elvira feels about kids, and it's pretty clear that she's far from enthusiastic. I seriously question if this woman has seen a child in person since becoming an adult, but I digress. In fairness, I'm pretty sure even a coked up Michelle Pfeiffer from Baltimore would be a stellar parent compared to Tony Montana. I mean, hey, at least she would make sure there was a nurse around who cared. This scene also serves as the first hint of where Tony and Elvira's relationship is really going. Now that Tony's done being a playful little small timer, he's looking to be the man in charge. The world is his, Chico, and everything in it, including Elvira. And Tony makes that very clear in this scene. His body language is more dominant this time around, and he talks to Elvira in a way where he seems to expect her to listen, whereas before, he didn't even really seem to mind as much one way or the other. The way he talks to her almost reeks of objectification. I know that term gets thrown around a lot, and it's not uncommon for people to abuse it because it's kind of a buzzword, 
But Tony is very explicit. He says that he needs a woman alongside him to cement his rise to the top, and even tells her that he intended for her to belong to him the moment that he saw her. Tony proposes, but not by asking Elvira to marry him. Instead, he simply says that he wants her to marry him and be the mother of his children. He doesn't pose it as a sincere question so much as he does proposition. Yeah, that's what a proposal technically is, but most partners wouldn't try to sweeten the deal by telling you that your current life is about to blow up in smoke. And that's essentially what Tony is doing by telling her that Frank is finished. Her best option going forward, or at least her seemingly safest option, is to hand herself off to another rich crime boss because her current partner is about to be murdered. Charming. The scene ends with a shot of Elvira biting her nails as Tony walks away, making it pretty clear that she's already having second thoughts, but what's she going to do? This is one of those offers-you-can't-refuse kind of deals, and I can't imagine that Elvira is unaware of this. One nightclub shooting and late-night business exchange later, Tony shows up at Elvira's bedside after killing Frank. Now he's not even posing a proposition. He straight up tells Elvira to get her things and that she's coming with him. At this point, she doesn't really even have a choice to make, and it's pretty apparent that Tony knows this. I mean, I guess she could say no, but... Where else is she going to go? Going from a millionaire with easy access to the coke you've been sniffing for probably years all the way down to being a broke bum doing favors in alleyways to fuel your addiction is far from an easy choice to make, especially if the millionaire you say no to is about to hit the peak of the local crime ring. Few people in their right mind would be willing to go that route, and it's not hard to see why. At least with Tony, she can maintain her comfortable, albeit reclusive lifestyle with the hope of getting to see that warm, playful side of Tony that she admires from time to time. The Push It to the Limit compilation even seems to suggest that the two of them had a good thing going for a brief time. The way she smiles and runs at their wedding has a very genuine energy to it. This is the happiest that she comes across in this movie by far. Unfortunately, it's shortly after this, in the very same compilation no less, that we'll be seeing not all is well and good in Paradise Vice, with Elvira not only doing coke alone in her room, but also smoking and drinking quite heavily in tandem. Up to this point, Elvira only ever smoked and drank a small amount when out for dinner at the Babylon Club. Sure, it was still an unhealthy mix, but her use was far more lax back then. That was expensive and high-quality champagne, so it's not as if there was an implication of alcohol abuse, it was just a nice party favor. Here she's throwing back what I would assume is either whiskey or brandy amidst a cavalcade of other toxic substances. She even bites down on her fingernails once more to close the shot. That's not the face of a happily married woman, that's someone who has just realized that the new life they'd built up in their head is even worse than the one that she had just had taken from her. At this point, Elvira only has two scenes left, and as much as I would hate to spoil the subplot of a four-decade-old film, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that things only get more miserable for Elvira from here. In her penultimate scene, Elvira has grown sick of Tony saying his favorite word all the time and finally lashes out at him. She criticizes and antagonizes him, saying that all he does is talk about money. Not only does she outright call him a racial slur, she further escalates things by comparing him with less favor to Frank. This is the most direct and hostile that she's been with Tony up to this point. And bear in mind where we are in the movie. Whereas before he might have responded with a mix of both serious and playful banter, thinking he was a hotshot underdog trying to score with the pretty girl, at this point Tony's hit the top. All he has left is foulness and spite. He's at the top, he doesn't need to prove anything, and in his mind, Elvira is his property, no more or less than his TV, his tiger, or his money. Tony responds by going on the defensive, claiming that he worked hard for what he has. He busted his balls climbing the ladder of the drug trade, and now he has the right to act however he wants. Elvira's response is cold, stating that Tony would have been a nicer person had it all just been given to him. Tony responds with a condescending ramble about how Elvira should get a job instead of waiting around all day for Tony to sleep with her. Elvira remarks that Tony's nowhere near the hotshot in bed that he thinks he is, to which Tony responds asking if Frank was better, finally prompting Elvira to storm off. I should probably make it clear at this point that while I sympathize with Elvira's struggles, she is by no means a precious little angel that needs coddling. 
She's a substance-abusing snob who wouldn't hesitate to hit below the belt for even the most minor argument, or if it was even slightly convenient for her. And she's by no means exonerated from taking responsibility for where she's found herself in life. Yeah, she has been used and abused by men in power, that's kind of the whole point of this video, but I also don't want to come off as if I'm making excuses for her either. I'm just here to analyze the character. At this point, Elvira only has one more scene to go, and it's pretty intense. During a dinner with Manny and Elvira, Tony laments how nothing he's worked for has been worth it, not the least of which being his substance-abusing wife, who he openly denounces for having a polluted womb that can't bear his child. Even Frank knew when to pull his punches. Yeah, the lesson number two remark was uncalled for, especially in a public setting, but what Tony says here is just downright despicable. As you can probably imagine, that is the last straw for Elvira, and I mean the last straw. After throwing her drink in Tony's face, she ridicules him for being nothing more than a drug-peddling killer, and mocks the very idea of him being a father. Tony accuses her of being stoned, which she may very well be. However, it's apparent that this is perhaps the most sober she's been for the entire movie. In a moment of total clarity and reflection, Elvira decries the fact that she's living an empty and unfulfilling life, with gangster stooges who work for the men she hates being her only friends, and the fact that her and Tony have become nothing more than a couple of high society losers with nothing of value to contribute. Tony scratched and clawed all the way to the top, taking advantage of every opportunity presented to himself, and sincerely busted his ass to build his life, only to end up just as much of a leech on society as those who had it handed to them. Really, the only difference between himself and those rich, horrible, corrupt CEOs and politicians is the fact that they know how to lie about it. In fact, that's probably why Sosa is such a success. When Manny insists that Elvira follow him to the car, Elvira tells him no, marking the first real decision that she's made for herself for the duration of the film. She says that she's not going with him and she's not going back home. And she makes true to her words, so much so that she doesn't even appear in the video game, which takes place after the events of the film in a what-if scenario. I think that's for the best, not just because it makes for a fascinating loose end, but also because it acts as something of a victory for her character. Anything is possible, be it her succumbing to drug abuse in an alleyway, repeating the self-destructive cycle of becoming an accessory to a rich man before finally turning up in the obituary's collateral damage, or managing to turn her life around through rehab and self-improvement. In the end, all we can really say is that, in her own way, she saw a sort of victory in claiming her independence from not only Tony, but but the life that she was living. She finally said enough's enough, and completely disconnected herself from the lives that were given and forced upon her. Her future is now her own to make. Tony's world may be his own, but now Elvira has the chance to find a whole new world. Even if it is just another man's world, she at least has something of a chance, and that's more than Tony or anyone else in his life can say. There's a bittersweet beauty to Elvira's departure from the world of Scarface. And I think that's the best ending we could have really hoped for, given just how bleak things were becoming towards the end of the film. Elvira may have hit rock bottom, but at least she got out of it, and just in the nick of time too, no less. That was quite literally her very last opportunity to leave before the shootout at the mansion. Even if we're to assume that Elvira found herself hitting rock bottom yet again, at least she made the active call not to settle with the waste of a life that Tony had planned for her. She refused to settle for the patriarchal chains that bound her, and after all she'd been through, finally took the initiative. Likely for the first real time in her adult life, she overcame the man's worlds which relentlessly objectified her and managed to go out with hope for the future. I personally like to imagine that she managed to turn things around for herself, perhaps with the help of some newfound friends with well-meaning intentions who helped to keep her on the straight and narrow. But it's also just as possible that she was unable to escape her self-destructive cycles as well as the systemic confines of living in a man's world. I'm sure we'll see some kind of spin-off material eventually, especially with how devoid of originality that modern Hollywood has become. But as it stands, I think no ending is the best ending for Elvira Hancock.
She's a compelling character with a bittersweet arc that's arguably just as fascinating as those of the magnetic personalities that surround her. She may not be as over-the-top and iconic as those she found herself surrounded with, but she is still a fascinating character. If anything, I think the fact that she manages to be as interesting as she is, amidst so many colorful characters, is a testament to just how well-written and performed she is. Elvira's great, and I hope that as time goes on and discussion of Scarface continues, that that her character manages to elicit the conversation that I believe she wholly deserves. There's a lot to talk about with this film, but it is honestly criminal just how overlooked Elvira tends to be when people discuss this film. Thank you all for watching. The reception to the Hannibal video has honestly been humbling, and I apologize that it's been so long since I've done a character analysis. I don't imagine this video is going to blow up like the Hannibal one did, but for those of you who do watch, your views, likes, subs, comments, and shares are always appreciated. I really enjoy making these character-centric videos, and I'm looking to do much more going forward. Since I've already done a television series and now a film, I'm hoping to do an analysis on either a book or a video game character next, but for now we're gonna have to wait and see. Until next time.